Um, because I'm plugged in, which is my machine. Is that okay? I intend to give us a five minute comfort break after this presentation. We're running five minutes late over here, but I'll try. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Um, okay, I'm going to take two seconds just to set up, and then we'll run straight into me. Go back to the slides. So yes, that's there. Uh, I know the video is running but I'm going to confess to you that I saved the file at midnight tonight, which did not launch this morning. So I did what we ask our undergraduates every time not to do. I haven't got a Google backup or a Google version. So the e-analysis file you will see is a mock-up I did this morning in approximately 10 minutes with um, uh, Pierre's assistance just to get the essence of what I wanted to get across done uh, with life. Uh, nonetheless, I've lost the version of my e-analysis file with arrows and with more information. But the actual thing I want to talk about is this anyway. How do we get to grips with live and interactive um, electroacoustic music? What is it that uh, is different from some of the fixed media work we've been hearing about just a second ago? And um, <coughs> what kind of extra features might I be asking Pierre to put in? Well, he introduced me to one at 9.15 this morning, which I hadn't got the score and the relationship of the score and the sound in the right position. So I'll bring that up again this afternoon because I learned something in, in the panic of not launching the original folder. Uh, as Lee and I gave the joint paper last week, which Lee just referred to a couple of uh, moments ago, uh, Ears lists 81 genres and categories uh, via the idea of an artistic grouping or a, 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 a performance situation. And in a sense, interactive music has both a genre and a category. It is both an artistic grouping and it's also a way, an approach for using technology, which of course is on the increase at the moment, the idea of the technology speaking to and fro from you. I also last week at the MS conference in Stockholm suggested that words such as parameters, variables, qualities, attributes, properties and features were kind of ambiguously overlapping in our got to look out for those parameters, variables, qualities, attributes, properties, and features which are relevant to what we actually want to get at in the music. And in a sense, it's a kind of tagging cloud idea. The different pieces of music and different genres have different clouds of these tags attached to them to get inside them some way. Effectively, what I want to do is to get away from discussion of genres. They inflect what we do, they help us form these things, then we've got to overcome them. And it may very well be that if I appear software, I use a language that was developed for one kind of music to examine another Lee's uh, one piece of his approach in some of the questions. But I scribbled down over the last month four essential areas that I want to address in looking at a piece that happens to be a piece of piano with live electronics. The idea that I've gone on and on about for 10 years or more, never really looking at it in real works, really have to get down to some analysis now rather than talking about it. What is a causal relationship? In other words, what is, are the tight and loose relationships between instrument, sound that we have when we have a performer? I have over the years developed local and field ideas, rather like Dennis Morley's spectrum morphology. I developed local and field as two words to help me compose or that came from compositional practice of what happens when you take a live performer and produce other sounds from that live performer, and ideas of locality, where I am, how I am changed by the electronics, as opposed to field qualities, which address something to do with the space surrounding us in some way. Also, in an OUP book chapter of a couple of years ago, it's by Roger Dean, I put forward different paradigms of how humans coexist in machines that we'll slide on that in a moment. And of course, the instrument sound relations, where the sound actually comes from. In the Hans Tuchkun piece I'll look at, you can hear the piano this in the sound around the piano. He hasn't really pushed it that far from the original. Uh, last week, these are the analysis slides. This is an approach to tape music, what we put on it, what kinds of language we use, the idea that we can use descriptive languages. What I declared to the MS conference last week is all prohibitions are off. 
the idea that you couldn't describe technological listening, the idea that you couldn't have a balloon being blown up or a cicada, rather wiry one on the right there, if that's what you hear in the sound say so, if what it tells you about the nature of the experience, then use that kind of language. So I'm very keen on developing a kind of improvisatory approach to PM software. You can chuck in stuff and rationalize it later. That's a piece of glitch. Fascinating how the image is so different between different kinds of music. If I hear main hum, I hear full main hum. So, waves of description and visualization affect the language we use. They're not independent of it. What do I have when I look at Hans Tuchku's piece? A piece for piano, interactive electronics. I heard a recording on it. I haven't heard a live performance. It has sound files and live processing all being triggered by the pianist, which is being tracked, back then with feed, foot pedal, the usual kind of standard Western art music presentation and production. We'll come back to that. He has put a video of a performance available, which I am using. Um, there are other recordings of the piece, which also can be referred to. Visualization has, therefore, for a piece such as this, different forms. We have the standard ones that Pierre has developed within the analysis, audio waveform, audio sonogram. But he allows us to run a video in parallel. He allows us to capture still images from the video at key points, which is a very useful tool uh, in the toolkit. And, of course, we have the possibility of a score Hans's score is relatively traditional. It uses extended kinds of notation, but it is five lines of eight stuff, largely written out actually in, in, in traditional um, time notation as well. I decided to challenge myself with this piece because I've talked a lot over the 25 or 30 years about the relationship of oral and mimetic and referential and abstract. Why don't I come to terms, I thought, with the dramaturgy overall ideas of a piece which does not refer to <coughs> real world sounds. It's really quite a difficulty actually because it's quite easy to deal with matters of real world representation. Piano? Rather different. What's it representing? What kinds of things does it do? I also challenge myself to use a listener oriented approach. I am not going to start with the score and work backwards or is it forwards from the score the listening experience. That is not the point. Nonetheless, I have called poetic leakage the idea that you can't do this 100%. We are not a blank sheet. And I am a literate person, and I do have to read program notes, usually afterwards, this is. And how does that influence what we do? So poetic leakage, we can't do without what the composer says completely, unless we wander into a space, and oh gosh, there's some music going on, I wonder what it is. Let's face it, that's extremely rare. Turn the radio on driving is another very good experience of naive listening if you don't know the composer. Those are rare events, though. So, my first idea was about causal relationships. I should say, in parenthesis, I've decided to give the entire slideshow, then I'll talk through the three minute extract and I'll, pu I'll put the arrows in verbally that were in my lost file. Anyway, causal relationships. The philosopher Braithwaite who, uh, whose book I read when I was a student about the philosophy of science, the idea of something happening regularly together. The idea of something happening regularly together is not necessarily a cause and effect pair. There has to be a logical relationship between the two things that are cause and effect. And in fact, in music, we've got a very interesting double take because we've got the idea of musical cause and real cause. Um, I'll describe those a little bit longer second. Now perhaps these things are also influenced by visual information. I say perhaps because when you're watching a performer they are influenced by visual information. Um, as listeners we do not hear causes, we hear effects. This is something that I've been saying a lot recently. I think this is quite important. Composers, theorists, computer music conferences tend to talk as if we're hearing causes. We're not hearing effects. And in fact, we've gone and verbalized something that our subconscious tends to deal with. If you hear a, 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 um, a twig snapping, it might be a tiger. You go into fear or flight mode, whichever. You don't stop and say in language, a twig has cracked 10 meters to my right behind me. I had better turn around and look at it. These things are, are, are relatively autonomic. They're dealt with by our subconscious system. Pre-linguistic operation, the 
sound of water. Is it a threat or will it save us? We hear the effect. We may act as if we know the cause, but it's not verbal and it's not necessarily conscious unless we, as analysts, as people interested as composers, actually make it so. A musical cause, for example. Stockhausen's Cantata, I saw him rehearse it once, a brilliant performance in London in the early 80s. The piano player was fantastic and synchronized exactly with moments on the tape, which we know he was mixed intellectually, that he gave the impression of causal relationships between the piano and the tape. And I have written about uh, Dennis Smalley's clarinet friend in an article in the Journal of New Music Research uh, 10, 12 years ago, which talked about the way the tape appears to cause the clarinet sounds as often as the clarinet appears to cause the tape sounds occasionally. That is musical causality something we as composers can do if we use time very intelligently. Obviously, there is a strong similarity to a real-world event. Carry this implication of X causing Y. Real causes really happen in real time. The piano plays, and its sound at that instant is carried on or processed or done something, carried on in that very general sense of something further happening. I seem to know this is the case. And looking again and again at uh, the video of Hans Fritsch Gustis, I came to a conclusion that our mind says, if something happens too often, it must be being caused by what I'm seeing. In other words, the once or twice in contact to where that pianist hits the moment exactly, or in clarinet threads, I know I can decode the fact that the tape isn't really causing the clarinet. But these things don't happen that often. But when I see the pianist hit a chord and something happens, and it doesn't happen once where it might have been a pre-recorded trigger, it happens for throughout the whole section. My perception system switches to, quote, believing, seeming to know, believing that, in fact, too many perfect synchronizations mean it's a real chord not something that's been programmed in by the composer. And in, I thank Gary for giving me the figures last night, um, I think that the instantaneous ideas are happening in the range of a perceptual time scale. So hit piano chords, something happens, there's a very small gap between the two. Order of magnitude, 250 mils up to, then we're immediately placing the two together in the same perceptual time frame. The second stage deduction to which I referred is about grouping things. It's about saying that it didn't just happen once, it always happened again, and again, and again, and again. Two to six seconds, but in fact the window's moving along. So in a stretch of music, you're looking at two to six seconds and how things work. And it's not a regularly pulsed Dean Reich piece either. It's got irregular pulses and it's always synced. You begin to think at a higher level of the causalities within there. The idea of the upbeat, the anticipation of an attack about to happen, is of course reinforced by the visual. Gary put forward in 2008, and he's developed it since, the idea of if you deal with an event schema, there's a section of it which, strictly speaking, our brain needs to put in if we can't see it, but often does. Even if we have an acousmatic listening, you might actually think in, perceive in, especially if something happens more than once, preparing, getting ready for a gesture, the, something that may even be silent, and then releasing energy. Now, in fact, of course, we see. So preparing, starting, ongoing, stopping might be preparing, starting, ongoing, stopping. You see that, and that is immediately reinforcing, Tim Ingold has written a lot about this, the actual sound you heard at that moment and the reasons for that sound being and the reasons for the processing through the electronic system. So we have no tabula rasa. We have templates that are built into our evolutionary system. Our information is patchy. We expect things to happen. I'm not talking about Leonard Mayer kind of expectations here. We have expectations of cause and effect, which we learnt probably before birth and after, certainly when we hit into things and solid objects uh, bounced off our bodies or we bounced off them. A displayed recording is, however, bit of an interesting issue because we're looking into the future several discussions at the MFE Stockholm last week about the fact that if you're looking at the 
center of the screen, you do actually see what's coming in the future in terms of the recording. How much does that influence what you are perceiving in the present? Right, moving into time, I will cut short in a second. No tabula rasa, we might have read the program next. The idea of an extended piano, prepared piano, electronically prepared, that might influence the way I listen. And the idea that we might have uh, read the composer's website and so on. I'm going to move relatively quickly through that slide. The idea of image influences what we hear. There's no question that the way the material is displayed is going to change my perception of it, especially as I say that we can see the future of it, and all the various images that affect the way we actually listen. This is not acousmatic listening. Even for you who compose and analyze acousmatic music, once you display it on screen and start looking at it, the image starts affecting the way you hear it. There's no question about that. Image type I've talked about space frames in my early article. I'm going to examine in the, the, the final version of this paper ideas of how the composer relates local and field. And I wish I had an eight-channel recording if this eight-channel worked. I don't. I shall have to try to work out in various ways uh, how the actual spatialization works. The composer has done different versions of the work. I am going to go on quite through because I'd like to just talk you through the two to three minutes that I put uh, in a basic analysis file. I shall examine ideas that I put forward in recent years about how the computer behaves with respect to the, the performer. The idea that it might become an independent performer or the idea that it might extend the performer as is within the act of performance. All right, I shall go through this and say that my final part of my um, analysis of this work I couldn't think how to approach meaning. I thought, well, I've quoted this slide too often. So why don't I actually remain true to what I want to do and say that what I really want to do in looking at the meaning of a piece of work is to take a kind of Christopher Small view and to take each of those relationships in turn and look at it. I added one relationship to the sound production. Issues of venue, issues of player electronic relationship, issues associated with sound relationships, issues of sound production and transformation. The composer's aim is an extended piano, but if I had not read the program note, what aspects of that would actually come across? And I'm not going to foreground the score, but neither will I particularly ignore it. I have, of course, got access to the score, though I know, even though I have what approaches a mono recording of this, um, not really got um, much information on the space of the size of the score. So here is uh, it's gone, it's changed size on the little screen, but what well, we'll just do it. Ah, it's gone on screen. Yeah, can I get the size of this? talk through where the arrows and things were. So, we can, of course, add a video. So I can listen through. I've got the score there. Pierre has shown me how to. Here we have a trigger as she moves into the first really big live electronic section. I call that a trigger rather than a tag. The cause-effect relationship happens every time she hits those chords. I no longer believe on the third attempt that this is a tape or this is some kind of other triggering mechanism. There's too good a synchronization between the two. The score is there to assist me work around and I refer to it only later. My first interest is in the relationship of her performing to the actual trigger pressure. I use the term attack for those moments which are punctuational, tend not to refer to the future, and I use the term trigger for those events which cause something immediately perceptible to happen. There 
has slowly emerged as recognizable piano sounds from these processed piano sounds. Only my visual information tells me that she's not actually scrabbling in the upper regions of the piano. Or is it? It's sonic. Everybody knows that transposed piano sounds sound a bit tinny. They sound a bit tinny, so they must be pre-recorded, I think. And into another causal section. by the third attempt, third strike, third trigger, fourth, fifth, I'm listening differently now. So those are the elements of dealing with lie. Score last. The meaning will lie in my looking at the relationships between the elements. And that's where I'll conclude. Lots more work to be done. Dislocation of cause and effect. Yeah. If you 
is it a piano chord there and things sustain that, which I think it is actually. Yeah. Uh, I, that I think of that as sort of field transformation. Mm -hmm. I actually think that reinforces the chords in me. Because if you have that happen half a dozen times within your time frame, I, I don't believe that could be something that's pre-structured. You are, you are back to hearing the liveness within the mix, I think. So I think space would assist the, 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 the live 